I'm sure you're familiar in some form over your academic career of a magazine called Forbes. It's a business magazine, and um, Zach is one of their uh, writers. He covers a lot of different things, although lately he's been dealing a lot with the music side of things. So you want to come on up, Zach? Um, obviously, you're all familiar with the book. Um, so, um, <clears throat> interesting book. Um, the unauthorized book. Um, you talk a little bit about, in the beginning of the book, um, some of the trials and tribulations you went through to get a sanctioned version. Um, I wonder if you could kind of regurgitate some of that. Sure, yeah. Um, well, you know, as you can imagine, a guy like Jay-Z gets a lot of business opportunities uh, thrown at him and a lot of things that don't involve you know, him actually getting paid anything. Uh, which is why he's got a team of gatekeepers, um, you know, to kind of pick out the best stuff. Um, and it's it's funny, since writing the book, a lot of people have come to me and asked me how to get to him, and I'm like, <laughs> he wouldn't even talk to me, you know? Why why are you asking me? But um, anyway, so I, I went through his main gatekeeper, a guy named John Manilli, um, who's a, you know, he's he's a, he's a very shrewd uh, guy, a former accountant. Um, who's been working with Jay-Z for a very long time. And, um, he's an accountant? Yeah. C you think he's CPA? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he, he plucked him away from a, a major accounting firm. I think he was just doing accounting. I might be getting this wrong, so don't quote me on it. But I think, I think he was just doing accounting for, um, uh, for Jay-Z back in the day, uh, back in the Rockefeller days. Uh, and Jay-Z just thought he was so good that he, he brought him in like in-house, stole him away from a, from a uh, major accounting firm. But I, I could be mistaken. That's how I recall. That part wasn't in the book. So, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, uh, I met with John Manilli. And you know, I went in there with, with my pitch, kind of you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, like very enthusiastic. And uh, this is, I was 24 at the time. Um, so this is, this is like uh, three or four years ago. And um, you know, I thought to myself, why, why wouldn't why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't Jay Z want to cooperate with the book? It's a business book. You know, he styles himself as a businessman. This seems like a great deal for him, having a Forbes writer write a business book about Jay Z and uh, blah blah blah. So you know, I kind of went in with that whole uh, very naive and optimistic attitude, and you know, I, I gave that pitch to Manili, and, and he said, "Well, well, what's in it for us?" And I said, so, "I mean, it's isn't it self-explanatory? It's uh, it's a free publicity. I mean, it's you know, it'll probably." cast him in a pretty favorable light. It's talking about he was a business genius and comparing him to Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and yada yada. Um, and and he, he, didn't, he didn't really care. He, he just, uh, he said, he continued, the, what's in it for us? Um, he, he kind of floated the idea of uh, maybe having me ghostwrite a business book, um, you know, something to that effect. Um, but basically doing something that would involve tearing up the deal that I already had with Penguin um, you know, and, and maybe, uh, maybe getting another deal. And they wouldn't do anything with the Penguin uh, book that ended up being my book um, unless it involved them having control or getting paid. Um, and it kind of surprised me at first, but, you know, but after a while I kind of realized that it made total sense. I mean, that's how Jay-Z operates. Um, and and I, I can't really fault him for that. I mean, it's gotten him really far. Um, obviously, uh, to the point where he is today. And if you look back at the history of, of Jay-Z and his different sort of extracurricular activities, you know, outside of music, some of the other ventures he started, um, it's all that same kind of blueprint. Uh, you know, in the, in the early Rockefeller days, in the late 90s, um, he was rapping about iceberg jeans and sportswear and stuff. And, uh, and after a while, he and Damon Dash went to the management and they said, hey, you know, we're generating all these sales for you guys. Can you give us an equity stake? or an endorsement deal or something like that. And the folks at Iceberg were like, no, you know, we're not really interested in dealing with hip hop artists or something really snooty. Um, so Jay-Z and Damon Dash thought to themselves, well, we'll make our own clothing line. And they did. And you know, in less than a decade, they sold it for $200 million. Uh, Jay-Z is still um, affiliated with the company. He gets an annual salary and bonuses based on performance. And he still has uh, some stock in the company that bought Rockaware. Um, but you know. It all fits a model, right? It's like 
why rap about something um, if I could rap about a comparable thing that I own? Uh, and you know, and Jay Z has kind of turned that into this, you know, gigantic sprawling business empire, um, large enough to be chronicled in a book. <laughs> what, what I find personally fascinating is um, one of my jobs in my checkered career was working at MTV, and uh, in the standards, and I would be the guy saddled with having to deal with standards, bring the videos to standards, and the one thing that MTV was overtly cautious about. Well, there's several things, but one of them was like product placement in, in music videos, whether it was lyrical or visual. And to realize in retrospect how things have changed, um, nonetheless MTV not really showing videos as we discussed last week, but that he has the ability to place products in his lyrics and it goes back so long ago, um, it's kind of fascinating. I mean. Equally fascinating is this man's career because, what, in a little over 20 years, he's put out maybe 12, 13, sorry, I use the word albums, um, and has risen to this pinnacle of success that is, um, you know, from the, in Brooklyn, from Bedford Stuyvesant to being one of the most successful um, popular entertainers in the world today, which is very well documented in your book. And I should add uh, that Zach disclosed to me on his way over here that this book is coming out in June in paperback. Indeed. With new additional updated material. Ad additional scoops, additional exclusive information. Uh, and, a, and a new foreword by Steve Forbes. So it should be, should be interesting. Steve Forbes, unlike me, uh, actually interviewed Jay-Z. So it should, should have um, perhaps some novel things to add to the So curiously, book. when you were turned down um, by John Minnelli for the book. This uh, mysteriously uh, came out uh, before? Uh, it came out about a year after my meeting with John Minnelli. Which, 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 which was released? Um, it, and, and, and about four months before my book came out. Um, you think they were coincidence? I think not. Uh, the, the funny thing about Decoded is that the ghostwriter is a, is a really talented um, and well-respected writer by the name of Dream Hampton. Um, I've got a ton of respect for her work, and uh, and she was initially um, brought on to write Jay Z's original uh, autobiography, which is called um, The Black Book, and that never got published. Um, it was set to go in 2003 with the Black Album, uh, and it it didn't uh, end up coming out because well nobody would really say why, but I think it might have had something to do with. That was right around the time he and Beyonce were getting serious, and like, you know, there were there was some thought that that maybe uh, too much had been revealed. I mean, and, and he's been interviewed about it a few times, and he says that you know he didn't say he didn't blame it on Beyonce, but he said that there were you know too many personal stories in there, so they shelved it. Um, and curiously, you know, uh, when when Decoded came out, it was the same ghostwriter dealt with a lot of the same things that it was supposed to. They were supposed to be, you know, touched on in the black book, um, and you know, but without uh, perhaps some of the more controversial parts. So, like, if you read through Decoded, there are a lot of scenes where where it's like, you know, we were there at three in the morning in the middle of the playground, you know, dead of winter, guns were drawn, glad we got out of there alive. <laughs> and so, well, wait, what happened? <laughs> like, how, how did you get out of there alive? I mean. Um, you know, like some, there must have been some action, uh, but you know that didn't really get explained. Um, why, why all the mystery? Um, I mean, it's documented, you know, that back in the early days in the projects that you talk about it in the book, he shot his brother, shot his brother. You know, so I mean, after you shoot your sibling, I mean, what else in your world isn't open for public scrutiny? So why? Like you know, it's like you had, you had to like peel an onion and to find out like basic information. When I mean, I, I, in a world of TMZ, it just seems odd that somebody would try to hide or be discreet about their their business successes or failures, for that matter. Um, you know, even even Beyonce, I guess they were so secretive about a whether they were getting married, when and where, and then oh, oh we're having a baby. You know. And yet he went through all these preparations at Lenox Hill Hospital to 
you know, feather the nest, if you will, for the forthcoming. I, I, I don't understand that. I mean, he's a public figure. I mean, he, he's open to a lot of scrutiny. Why? I mean, why? I mean, why put all these roadblocks and impediments to you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think to some extent, um, people have a short memory. The media has a short memory, um, and you know, uh, I think Jay Z remembers pretty well, um, you know, a time when, not really very long ago at all, um, that a, that a lot of advertisers and companies didn't want to deal with rappers because of this image and. Um, you know the, the the image of him being a drug dealer probably cost him this uh, this Jay Z Jeep deal that I detail in, in the book um, that was going to happen around 2005 it looked like it was going to happen there was a change in management at Chrysler and the new people who came in you know didn't want um, a car branded towards somebody who had been a drug dealer um, you know of course just a couple of years later we have uh, Snoop Dogg appearing in Chrysler ads so. It's like um, you know, this is somebody who is involved in death row and the like, all that stuff on the West Coast, you know, gangster rap, and, and like not exactly um, you know the the most family friendly history, um, and yet who's managed to turn himself into this kind of lovable family friendly pop rapper. Um, but anyway, um, you know, but but I think that Jay Z was worried um, about you know bringing some of that stuff to light uh, in in the Black Book and. You know, and, and really um, kind of detailing some of the stuff that happened uh, during his life of crime in the early days, um, even even if it had you know already been kind of reported and written about long ago, he didn't want to dredge it up and you know and kind of remind people of that because it might turn off you know advertisers, corporate partners, and, and things like that. So. I don't know, the hypocrisy of it astounds me. You know, we have people running for president who, you know, are, you know, fathering children, um, you know, and all sorts of things like that, but... Tying dogs to roofs. Right. Mitt Romney. So, yeah. um, and then, I mean, he, it, it's pretty amazing with, with 12 albums what he's, what he's um, accomplished. Um, so, um, I had taken the liberty of having some of the students um, prepare some questions. And so, after all, it's to benefit them, not you and I. So I figured um, I'd start with them. Sure. And um, Melanie uh, poses this question that uh, goes to page seven of the book, <laughs> uh, that Jazzo says that Jay-Z has his loyalty to his money. And she said, after reading the book, I pretty much agree, but unlike most artists who might come off arrogant when they're surrounded by money, I think Jay-Z is rather modest about it. Um, do you think that's because he never really let the fame and money get to his head too much before not seeming conceited or egotistical? And that he's become so successful, do you think it's based purely on his various businesses or perhaps a combination of all of the above? Hmm. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I do get the sense that he's a pretty down-to-earth guy. Um, and you know, uh, his loyalty may be to his money, but I think that you know, a, another thing that people forget is that when you become you know, even a little bit successful in any field, um, you have all these people, oh, I used to know you way back when, you know, oh, like, let me hang out with you now. Yeah, I want to I wanted PC you because you're famous or whatever. Um, and, and then when you have somebody who's made it to the level that Jay-Z has, um, and when you consider the poverty of where he came from, you know, there are a lot of people um, saying, you know, oh, you know, I used to know you back in the day, blah, blah, blah. Um, and there are also a lot of people trying to take credit uh, for kind of what he became, um, you know, from somebody like Jazzo to Damon Dash. Um, and a lot of these people have valid claims. They were mentors to him or they helped him get his career off the ground. Um, but, uh, you know, but in the end, it's, it's like Jay-Z says on, uh, I think it was on his last album, maybe it was Kingdom Come, he says, you know, you have all these people saying you made Hove, okay, make another Hove, you know? And, uh, and so I think um, a lot of people feel like he owes them something, but, you know, he can't spend all his time just kind of giving, you know, like giving away his time to anybody who thinks that he owes them something, because then he wouldn't be doing anything other than that. Um, you know, and, and I think that it probably comes across as callous and, um, you know, and results in him turning down uh, people and maybe cutting people out unfairly um, and being cold-hearted in some cases. 
Um, but I think it's always a fine line when you reach that level of fame, you know, how much, I mean, you know, you, don't, you, can't, you can't do everything. Um, and where do you draw the line between people who were actually helpful to you and people who are just kind of glomming on, um, riding the coattails? And was the, ne the next, I didn't get to the next one. Well, um, do you think that um, he never let the fame or money get to his head too much? Because um, not allowing him to become conceited or egotistical, and that um, his success is based upon his various businesses or perhaps a combination of things. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I think, I think uh, with his success, is it the business or is it the music? Um, you know, I think, like you said in the, in the documentary, uh, you have to make a great product first before you can go and make a business out of it. Um, you know, Jay-Z wouldn't be where he is today if he didn't keep making really good, relevant music. Uh, and staying kind of ahead of the curve, and you know, I mean, may maybe he, I, I don't know how far ahead. I mean, you know, he's not considered an avant-garde rapper anymore, and he's not like, you know, um, I don't know, doing a dual album with Bon Iver or something. But but then he's working with Kanye, who's got Bon Iver on his song. I don't know um, what, what my point is here. But uh, I guess I guess it's that if, if he had stopped making good music. Um, if he'd stopped making relevant music, he would have fallen off the map. I mean, if you look at somebody like 50 Cent, he's still around and he's still, you know, making noise. Um, but he, he doesn't have that kind of cachet that he did um, in the early to mid 90s when, when he, he had that huge record and, and everything he touched was turning to gold. Um, you know, he's still doing pretty well for himself. But I mean, Jay Z has managed to to maintain that level of of relevance and power because he keeps making music that people want to hear and doing interesting things and you know. Um, uh, watch the throne, you know. I think regardless of what you think of it, it's a pretty interesting artistic statement, really well produced. It's kind of groundbreaking in terms of having, you know, two stars the size of Jay Z and Kanye. But it really kept him in the conversation um, in a way that I think opens up, keeps a lot of doors open for him on the business side. All right, um, Amanda asks. Um, he has uh, Jay Z has intriguing relationships. Good word. With both Biggie and Nas, uh, one is a comrade and one is an adversary. You think um, his publicities of his business relationships are part of a larger motive for more publicity, or do you think similar publicity model, models such as that are still relevant? Uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that he's definitely used both. I think he genuinely respects both rappers, but he's also used uh, his relation, uh, his relationships, both friendly and adversarial, with each of them to kind of further his own brand, I mean, for sure. Um, you know, he only really became close with Biggie in the last year or two of, of his life. Um, but, you know, in, in the late 90s, when Jay-Z was still kind of coming up, and there was this battle, you know, after Biggie died, there was this sort of battle for who was the king of New York, and, and the, the most, you know, legit contenders were basically Jay-Z and, and Nas, depending on who you ask. Who you ask. But, you know, Jay-Z really kind of, even as he was trying to make a claim for that crown, um, you know, he was moving his music towards more of a pop sound. I mean, don't forget 1996, Reasonable Doubt, um, you know, was, was a pretty gritty record um, and, and not at all the kind of the pop sheen um, that some of his later stuff had. And his next album, um, which was produced by Puffy, uh, you know, was really very much aimed at crossing over into more of a pop sound. So as he was doing that, he needed to kind of maintain um, his street cred and I think attaching himself to Biggie and, and kind of reemphasizing that um, that relationship that they had kind of gave, gave him some added credibility. And then fast forward, um, you know, a couple years, uh, Jay Z's you know probably the the number one rapper in the game by that point. Um, you know, he'd made a couple more huge uh, pop records, and you know, you, you hear Hard Knock Life on every radio station, and it's like, well, you know, how do I, um, you know, how do I, how do I take that and and kind of maintain that um, that image as you know, as a as a legitimate rapper who's who's not just trying to sell out and everything. And so I think that was part of his motivation for for um, you know, kind of going at it with Nas is you know. Uh, Re-energize the base, um, you know, burnish your credentials as as a rapper and and um, not just as somebody who's selling out to chase this kind of larger pop prize. Um, different question, different direction. Amanda wanted to th your thoughts on that. Um, that it's established that Jay Z in your book talked about it. he helped the roots 
um, due to some of his past connections uh, that he had and he used it with Radiohead. How important do you feel the relationships Jay-Z made, uh, Jay made aided in the advancement of his own career? Um, yeah, you know, I think, uh, I think that, you know, early in his career, he had a lot of different mentors uh, who helped him in his own, in, you know, getting to where he is today. Um, you know, and as I was talking about before, I think some of them maybe got a little jealous when he got bigger than, than they were, um, you know, and felt compelled to maybe try to claim a little bit of the credit. Um, but you know, but you can see uh, after Jay Z kind of outgrew all his mentors and or you know ditched them. If you <laughs> you could also look at it that way, um, you know he started mentoring artists on his own too. Um, and you know if you look at there are, there are a lot of uh, major artists who owe at least some part of their success to Jay Z now. I mean Rihanna, um, you know he certainly mentored her. Um, you know even somebody like Rick Ross, um, more recently Jay Cole. Um, Kanye for sure, uh, and, and there's a new British woman. Um, he just brought the Z100. So upstart. Anybody? Uh, I forgot her name. Yeah. Oh. Um. And it's it's coming through Sony too. Okay. So, okay. Anybody familiar with that artist? No. Um. But you know, even the the relationships that Jay Z has made in terms of being a mentor to other artists have served him well lately too. Because, you know, n now that he's getting older, uh, I think it helps him to stay relevant. Um, you know, to have a young artist like a J Cole or even somebody a little older, like you know, younger than him but older than J Cole, like Kanye, um, and and to kind of be allied with somebody like that, um, you know, allows. There was a, there was a great piece. Um, I forget where I mean, it was. I forget where it was, but it was, the, it was called The Global Hegemony of Jay-Z, and it was talking about how it was kind of comparing the relationship of Jay-Z and Kanye to the UK and the US, and like that, you know, I don't know, that Kanye was a former colony of Jay-Z, and, <laughs> and, you know, he had grown as big as, as uh, his former colonial boss, but now they were these great allies, and they were, you know, Becoming um, more relevant together than than either of them could be alone, and that you know that that whole kind of thing. Um, but you know, I mean, I think it, you know it was a strategic move on his part, and you know um, now because he's mentored a lot of young artists, like you don't have you know quite as many artists coming at him, you know, kind of challenging uh, him for the throne. Instead, they kind of come and try to kiss the ring, get him to do a you know guest appearance on uh, on their on their big single or whatever. That's right. Um, question from uh, Kelly. Um, in your opinion, who helped whose career more, Jay Z or Beyonce? Or, or I'm sorry, Jay Z or Biggie? Is it Biggie. Oh, I think uh, I think Biggie definitely helped Jay Z's career more because Biggie, I think Biggie really died before Jay Z ever got anywhere um, near as big. Um, you know, I, I think it, while Biggie was alive, uh, Jay Z wasn't. Quite big enough to make that much of a difference. However, I would argue that if you want to factor in the the, the um, you know if you want to expand career to include you know after death, um, you could probably make an argument that they helped each other equally because having the you know the, the kind of the top rapper in the game continually reference Biggie. I mean, just every album you know it's it's quoting a Biggie line or every concert is you know. Turn off the lights and put up the lighter for Biggie. Um, you know, just as uh, Biggie, the association with Biggie helped make Jay Z relevant. Jay Z's continued um, admiration for Biggie probably, you know, helps keep Biggie relevant. Although I think he would have remained, I think he would have remained relevant anyway. But that's just me. Here's an interesting thought um, from Corey. Do you think celebrities, such as musicians like Jay Z, Need to become business moguls to stay relevant and become household names. So I say that again. Celebrities and musicians like Jay Z, do they need to become business moguls to stay relevant and become household names? Um, you know, I, I don't think they need to. Uh, if you look at Little Wayne, um, or to some extent Kanye, they they really focus much more on on the art. Um, and it was only we were just talking about this uh, on the way over here. Um, that you know, Little Wayne has been around for 10, 15 years, um, 
and it was only this year that he finally went and did the clothing line and the big uh, endorsement deal with Mountain Dew. Um, so you know, I don't, I don't think you need to have uh, you know the, the kind of business apparatus um, in, in order to stay relevant. Um, however, it's, it's become such an acceptable thing. Uh, you know, people aren't really cast as sellouts for you know for doing it. I mean, I don't see why you wouldn't. Um, I guess I was kind of surprised that it took Little Wayne as long as it did to see him getting involved in some of that kind of stuff. Um, and um, you know, but I think it's a different story when you talk hip hop versus rock. And I think hip hop as a genre, in many ways, is um, a reaction, like a celebration of wealth. I mean, depending on right, if you're, I guess not if you're talking like backpack rap or you know, like I wouldn't call Lupe Fiasco a celebration of wealth, but um, you know, so much. But you know, but certainly mainstream hip hop in a, in a lot of ways is you know, it's 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 coming from a place of poverty to you know to to rising up and, and making it. You know, it's a celebration of, of having made it, make it as an aspirational genre, I would argue. And uh, you know, rock on the other hand is kind of a reaction against wealth. And you know, it's it's by kids who grew up in the suburbs with you know too much money and they're really bored and and they don't like it. And and so it's you know it's kind of being upset about that situation. Um, and as a result, I, you know, and I, certainly when I do interviews, I find that the rockers are a lot less likely. A, to talk to me to begin with, um, you know, talk to Forbes financial publication um, about what they're doing, because it's probably going to talk about how much money they have, and that doesn't really jive with their whole, their whole um, persona. Whereas um, with most of the hip hop artists I talk to, it's like, yeah, you know, um, like look at all these, yeah, I mean, I, I started this company and I rap about it. Isn't that awesome? And, and yeah, you know, it's, it's not, there's not a shame to it um, so much, I think. There's not such a stigma, um, you know, to, toward making money in hip hop as there is with well, rock. The next question curiously kind of segues into that, and I'm going to assume this question was asked by Christine because the ink matches. Um, nobody put their name on this one, so maybe somebody come up to afterwards and tell me if this is yours. So you get credit for the question. But so with Jay Z heavily investing into Carol's daughter, the natural beauty products, do you believe it slipped under the hip hop radar because it didn't seem like a hip hop rap thing to do, or because he just wanted out, do hip -hop, uh, does hip hop make artists find it more difficult to associate um, with um, womanly things? Interesting. That's a really yeah. good question, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, I mean, he definitely didn't hide it. Uh, he rapped about it in, on Kingdom Come, I think, on Beach Chair, which was, so Kingdom Come was, I think, 2000, 2005, 2006. And on that, that track, Beach Chair with Chris Martin, he said, I'll leave my daughter a share of Carol's daughter, my share of Carol's daughter and a shiny blue beach chair, something like that. Um, you know, so, so he, he's not hiding it. I think it's just, it's not a, like a sexy thing. I think people, you know, don't really glom onto it the way, like you don't, you know, bring your shampoo to the club. I don't know, like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a flashy, you know, visually fascinating thing, like a shining golden giant bottle of champagne, you know, like, that you can like pop and drink and all this stuff, you know, it's it's like okay, well, shampoo or whatever, just it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really do it for from like a flash standpoint. So, so is it not cool in hip hop to be associated with a female leading product? Oh man, that's a, you know, I don't. I, that's a really good question. Just your good opinion, obviously. I'm trying to think. Of, I'm, I'm trying to think of examples. Um, well, like Nilly had uh, apple bottom jeans. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, you know, or I think with with the you know with the clothing side of things, um, you know, I think that that's targeted at least as much toward women as towards men in some cases. But I think, I think I guess it just depends on the on the type of product. Um, I mean, I think if it were like men's shampoo or men's deodorant, it, it would be equally kind of forgotten about because um, it's not it doesn't have that kind of sex appeal. So. As long as we're talking about products, let's talk about what's his. What's the champagne brand that he? Uh, Armand de Brignac, Ace of Spades. So I hope you guys found that chapter as intriguing as I did. But um, it was like you were playing, you know, detective, going through, you know, whether he he serves it at his at his club, because um, the folks at Crystal made a sort of a snide remark about the hip hop community. And Jay Z took offense to that, 
and sort of put his imprimatur behind this other brand with no motivation whatsoever other than to correct the ills of the world. But then you kind of dug a little scratch underneath the surface there and found out, well, maybe it was, there was some more motivation there than just uh, you know, making things right. Yeah, I mean, uh, basically when I set out to write the book, um, you know, this is one of the things that I really wanted to dig into because, you know, Jay-Z's got Armand de Brignac, Ace of Spades. He mentions gold bottles or Armand de Brignac or Ace of Spades or Ace or something like that um, in just about every big song he's got. And, it, you know, if you look at uh, the artwork for American Gangster and a lot of his other albums, it's just, you know, pictures of the bottles of the champagne. Um, if you go into the newly remodeled 4040 Club, uh, <laughs> which is still overpriced, and um, I went there the other day and it gave me indigestion. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the, the food or the price? Both. <laughs> okay. Um, they, they had kind of like a, like a grand re reopening, um, and, and they just like a little media tour thing. And, uh, and they have in, in the middle of... And they, and they invited you even after you wrote this book. They did. I know. I, I said, I said you, you know it was an unauthorized book, like, and you guys invited me to these things. I, I was like, this is always surprising to me. And they were like, we know. So I said, well, what's the... So, so you just kind of like he doesn't care or he doesn't think about it. And they're like, yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't think he really cares. Like, I don't think he's... He's out there on the phone with his publicist being like, did you invite that Zach O'Malley Greenberg to like my media tour of, of my, my restaurant? Because if so, you've got to cut him off the list. I think he's probably got, uh, you know, got like other things on his, on his mind. But, but no, I thought that too. Um, but they have in, in the middle of the, uh, of the 4040 Club, it's, there's this giant column made out of gold bottles of Armand de Brignac champagne. And um, the tour guide was, was bragging about how this was a million dollars worth of champagne in the middle of the, of the thing. So when I wrote up my article, I wrote, it's a million dollars retail. Because <laughs> so the, the whole point of it that I found basically, I was like, but why is he, you know, clearly he's got a financial in interest in this. I mean, if I, you know, I learned one thing about Jay-Z is that he doesn't give away promotion. He doesn't give away anything for free. Um, and there's no way that he would be doing this all just out of the goodness of his heart. So, um, you know, I basically, uh, the journey took me from Harlem to France um, and back. Uh, I became friends with this guy named Branson B, who, um, who used to bring champagne and other goodies to Biggie and Jay-Z back in the day um, and was kind of the Pied Piper of champagne um, in hip hop in the late 80s and early 90s. And he was the one who alerted me to the fact that in, there was a, uh, a champagne, another gold bottle produced by, the, by Cartier, the company that makes Armand de Bignac, that had been in production um, for ages. And it was called uh, Antique Gold. And it looked just like Armand de Bignac Ace of Spades, but it had a different label. It was the same gold shiny bottle. And it sold for 60 bucks a pop. And he actually had an empty bottle of it in his, in his, um, in his like, little wine den. Uh, and he showed it to me, and and so um, you know I went, I sniffed around New York as much as I could, and online trying to find answers, and I called every you know federal you know and state agency that you know tobacco, uh, the Bureau of Tobacco and Firearms, and you know all the and uh, and alcohol is that is that what it's called? I don't know. It's some government body that regulates all those things. And um, you know, I called you know everybody at all these different companies, the distributors, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I just kept getting stonewalled. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to go out on a, like on a limb here. I'm just going to call up the the head of Cartier in France and say, hey, you know, can I come out and and interview you for this book? And to my much to my surprise, um, they said yes. They said we'd love to come come to France. And maybe that I wouldn't actually do it. Um, but no, they're like, all right, come. Just you know, here, here's our address. So I showed up in France a couple months later, and they took me on this whole tour. Um, they took me into their wine cellars, and and um, you know, and, and it was funny because I was like walking around, and there were all these gold bottles, and they didn't have labels on them. They were just you know, kind of sitting there, and and uh, and, and you know, it was like the gears started to turn. So he's telling me the whole story about the you know the company and um, you know how Armand de Brignac, uh, that brand, uh, started out in in. Um, I think it was 2000, 2005, it was 2005, I guess, 2005, 2006. 
and uh, which you know was the first year that Jay-Z started rapping about it. And I said, well, how did Jay-Z find out about it? And he said, oh, he, you know, he found it in a mom and pop shop in New York. And you know, he, just, he just liked it so much that um, he ordered it uh, you know, to, to be used in his video. Um, and we were, wow, well, what could we do? It was, it was so great. And uh, you know, that he was so generous with his um, time and giving us all this free publicity, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you know they're they're very nice to me, and we sat around drinking champagne, and you know, and they continued to tell me the story, and and I said, okay, and, you know, so we're like getting to the end of the uh, of the interview, and, and and so I do the the Columbo thing. I'm like, but one more question. Um, it's like, if he found the uh, the champagne in a mom and pop shop in New York, how was he able to use it in his video? Because the video came out when. You know when this thing was launched, like in the U.S. as a as an actual product, there was like it couldn't have been in a, how could it have been in a store before it came out? Um, how could he have you know how could he have known to do that to get it into his video? And then they be with the backtracking and and then they they finally admitted that there had been talks and and so on and um, I was able to get a couple of uh, industry people to confirm, uh, although they wouldn't go you know they wouldn't put their name out uh, you know. Because for fear of, I guess, uh, <laughs> reprisal, business reprisal, um, you know, to say, yeah, you know, it's, you know, he owns, he owns a stake in in the brand, um, which you know, which was kind of what I had suspected all along, um, but you know, I'll never know why, the um, the folks at Cartier who were who were really like genuinely kind to me um, and, and wonderful people, but I don't know why they agreed to talk to me. Because they knew that you know that this was something he was getting a, a financial interest in, and and I guess some part of me wonders if you know maybe under their agreement um, they weren't supposed to talk about it, but maybe they wanted people to know that he had a stake in their company, and you know maybe maybe it was a case of oh oh the, this reporter found out oh no now you know now everybody knows that there's an official connection maybe they wanted it that way but they didn't want to make it look like it was coming from them i don't know but that's only one of the products he has a vested interest in um, exactly i mean there's there's other things and, and marco's asking this question many critics suggest that his business endeavors are second rate the nets reebok uh, do you consider these brands to be the extent of Jay-Z's reach, or is Jay using a tactic similar to when he transferred, you know, transformed the champagne, Armin Brown? Um, so there was a question, do, do people consider him to be the, no, the, the, that, last, that he's, the last part? No, that you're, the critics are suggesting that some of the business endeavors and products he's uh, aligned himself with are, are possibly second rate. Um, and what was the second part of that? Um, do, do, you want, they want to know if you consider those brands to be the extent of his reach, um, or, oh, yeah. or is he using a tactic? Um, you know, yeah, I think uh, regardless of what you think of the quality of any of those brands, um, all of them are definitely the number two or three in their field. It's, it's the, right, but it's like why, why would, you know, the Knicks don't need more celebrity, like they don't, the Knicks don't need to give you know, Spike Lee a sweetheart deal on an equity stake to get him to root for them. They're the they're the name you know they're the name brand team. Um, the the Nets needed uh, a face like Jay Z on their team, um, and they needed to give him a deal on his equity stake in the team in order to lure him. Because otherwise, why would he want to associate himself with with a uh, a second you know with the, with the second fiddle team? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I guess the point is that. The second fiddle, whatever it is, always needs a Jay Z, right? They always need, they always need to buy some cool, um, and in some cases, uh, you know, you know, I, I think I don't know. I think the, the remarkable thing is that it, it doesn't seem to have watered down Jay Z's brand, and there's not this perception of like, you know, Jay Z is just goes to the highest bidder or whatever. Um, but I think he's also even even though he ends up doing. Uh, deals with you know the proverbial second fiddle a lot of the time, be it um, Reebok or the Nets or, or uh, you know, I guess Duracell is another one. I feel like Energizer is the number one battery. Anyone? I don't know. Um, wow. But you know, it, he he does it in a way that um, that it kind of that that you're like oh well, 
you know, it's it's it makes sense for him. Like with uh, with Reebok, they gave him his own shoe line. It's not just like he's going out there, you know, saying go buy some cross trainers or whatever. Um, they they you know the Nets, uh, you know, allowed him to be um, an owner, you know, co-owner of a basketball team. I mean, they they allow him um, the opportunity to kind of say, you know, hey, look at my thing that I have that is, you know, totally mine and I'm designing and, you know, informing. And yes, it's under the auspices and the umbrella of, of this larger uh, organization, but, you know, but this is a Jay-Z thing. Um, and you're, you're buying Jay-Z, you're not buying Reebok. You're buying Jay-Z, you're not buying the Nets. What about, um, okay, so we know he's got the 44 club, the 4040 club. Um, we know he's got the Nets. Now he's got the... Um, He's involved in the Brooklyn Barclay Center. Um, he's got a stake in English soccer. It's fascinating with the, the the Arsenal team. I think that 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 didn't actually go through. Did it? I don't know. He, he he's bought some real estate in Chelsea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that is fascinating is there's a racetrack, the Aqueduct situation, right. um, where there's talk about awarding them a um, gambling rights there, I guess slot machines and, and whatnot. Um, and he somehow had an involvement with that. I, I don't know if he still does. Yeah, there was a, there was a, big, a big thing with, um, I think it was under Governor Patterson, and he brought in Jay-Z and a couple of other people uh, to be investors in this new, I guess it was a renovation plan. Um, Right. But it, and they and they wanted to have some affirmative action, obviously. Right. So. And but I think in the end it, it fell through. There was it had something to do with there were there were I think that Patterson had recruited somebody who was kind of shady and then they got in trouble and the whole thing got scuttled. But um but Jay Z I think was brought in to be kind of like a you know, respectable face and to, to get people excited and riled up. I mean as he did with the Nets, because honestly, you know, the the stadium hasn't been the most, um, rather hasn't been the least controversial thing in Brooklyn. You know, there's been a lot of uh, protesting, and you know, I mean, they've had to kick people out of their houses and tear down buildings in order to put it up. Um, you know, but I think, and, and Jay Z's definitely drawn some criticism for kind of being the face of, of the Nets and you know, kind of going along with something that a lot of people see as being, you know, kind of edging out the little guy. Um, but I think that you know, with the with actually, like, there was the same appeal for having him on board. And isn't he have a piece of a that Broadway show? Uh, Broadway yeah, Fela, name? Fela. He was a producer on Fela. Had a name attached to it in any in yeah. any case. Yeah. And then um, they're talking uh, about his uh, philanthropic activities, as they may be. Um, well, he I guess he did some documentary with MTV on on um, water. Yep. Um, and then he was involved in, I guess, hurricane relief. Donated a million Katrina. dollars to Hurricane yeah. Katrina relief. Yep. And um, yeah, I guess I guess that's you know. And then his political involvement, obviously, you know, backing Obama. Um, I guess putting some money in there um, in that campaign and uh, being involved in some of that stuff. So um, Rebecca was asking if. Um, in deals like Jay-Z's investment with the Nets, do celebrities get discounted rates because their investments will cause the public to pay more attention to the endeavor, or is that just they're in it for the, just the, the fame? Um, no, no. I mean, I think they, you know, they, the teams definitely have an interest in bringing in the celebrity to, to draw more uh, attention to their team. And, you know, I mean, you can look at it, um, you know, if, if the Nets give Jay-Z, uh, you know, a stake in the team that's worth three million dollars, and they and he pays one point five million dollars for it. I think that's I think that's what the numbers were, but I'd have to go back and look in my book. Um, you know, they're they're giving him an equity stake at half price, but you know, they could also look at it like they're essentially giving him, you know, a one point five million dollar equity stake at face value, and then they're paying paying him one point five million dollars in addition to to act as a spokesperson. Um, you know, so it's it's kind of like you're you're basically being paid to endorse something, but instead of a one-off fee, they're they're just paying you an equity, um, and I think that that's a, you know it's a great 
great model for a lot of artists. Um, it worked out really well for Jay-Z. It worked out really well for 50 Cent with the whole vitamin water thing. Um, he made $100 million off of that mistaken <laughs> vitamin water. Right. Um, but I, you know, I think also there's been um, a little bit, of, like, pe like people have been getting a little equity happy. Um, you know, they watch Jay-Z and they watch 50 Cent. And it's like, oh, you know, I want you like, don't, don't give me any money up front. Just you know, give me back end or give me an equity stake. Um, and that's not always a good idea if the thing you're getting a stake in isn't valuable. <laughs> um, and so I think that you know, there, there was a little bit of a trend toward that. Um, and if you look at Jay Z, uh, you know, he actually he sold his clothing company um, because he he thought that he was getting a big enough, um, you know, two hundred million dollars for the company uh, was more than fair. And then I think he gets I think it's five million dollars a year um, to act as a spokesperson plus uh, stock options and you know performance bonuses stuff like that. Um, you know, so that's he made the calculation that you know if it's a certain amount of cash, it's actually you can actually get way more than the equity would have been worth anyway. Um, and, you know, so it's like don't don't stick to just one thing. And you know, and if a better deal comes along, it doesn't matter if it's the old model, right? Like. Doesn't matter. You know, everybody's talking about. Oh, you should be an independent artist. Never sign with a record label. You know, just just be an indie act and you know publish straight to the web, and you don't have to pay the record label all this money. Yeah, but you know, if if somebody came along and offered you a ten-year, hundred and fifty million dollar contract uh, like Jay Z got from Live Nation, you'd be you'd be foolish not to take that because you know, I mean, they're just there's a, there's a point where. Uh, where labels are going to overpay, um, and if you can get a, a label to overpay, um, you know that certainly trumps um, being you know, independent. I mean, you could you could make a lot of money as an independent artist, but you know you can't make more than you know getting somebody to overpay. That's always the best. I want to talk more about the record side of things, but um, Amin asked a follow-up question on regarding the Nets. Do you think um, Jay Z shopped around and thought, hmm, if I can get this from the Nets, what could I get if I went to another team? Uh, it would, wouldn't shock me, but I think, you know, I think probably for him it was the Knicks or the Nets. Um, and I think the way it went down with the Nets is that uh, it's, it's in the book. I think it was at Jason Kidd's birthday party, and um, and Jason Kidd jokingly suggested to Jay Z that he should buy a stake in the Nets. And Jay Z kind of started thinking about it, and then he's, you know, was like, "All right, well, I'm interested." And then they started having conversations. But knowing Jay Z, I bet, I bet he at least went to the Knicks and said, "Hey, you know, the Nets are going to offer me this. If you want to offer me the same deal, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd rather go with you guys." But, you know, the Dolans, I don't think really about handing anybody anything for free. No. <laughs> Either. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, and in the process of establishing his brand name, uh, you think there are any steps he would do differently or could do differently? Um, you know, I think maybe he would have done a second album differently because that's the one that he he's uh, most frequently talks about. If you could have one back, um, you know that that would be it. Um, volume one uh, it was was not a really good album in my opinion. Um, you know, he he admits that it it was probably his least favorite. Um, and that was the one where you know Puffy produced it. He was going really hard uh, toward the pop end of things, and um, you know, he, he, I've heard him say in interviews that he was really torn up about Big E and uh, dying, and he, he wasn't thinking straight. And I mean, um, you know, regardless of whether that's the case, he, I think he probably would have gone back and, you know, rather than just making something to appeal to a pop crowd uh, that that sounded like other pop. You know, rap that was kind of going on at the time. Maybe he would have put more energy into into making something that was just objectively great. Um, you know, that would draw people to it. Uh, and you know, in the end, that record wasn't the one that put him over the top. It was the one after, I think, uh, that had Heart Knock Life on it, um, which which really you know made him into a global superstar. That's true. I was thinking um, it's probably hard for anyone in this room other than uh, Dr. Marconi and myself, to realize that there was life on this planet before Jay-Z was a known musical entity. Um, and it's an interesting thought to put in that perspective, but um, Scott had asked a question here um, that he's, jay Z's recognized for being quite savvy in his business dealings, both musically and <clears throat> in the drug game. Um, in today's industry, do you think those tactics would still work? Hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, either way, you have to have really good product. <laughs> um, and, you know, it has to, it has to stand out. Like, uh, if you watch American Gangster, what was that? There was a special name. It was a blue, was a blue Magic. Blue Magic, it was like this great, right. you know, this like really special stuff. Um, and maybe it was a little more pure, but you know, but the brand, I think they had, they had like a special sticker on it, you know, and um, it's not that different, right? It's not that different from, you know, from, from the other stuff, uh, but, but it has a special sticker on it. And, and I think in, the, in that same way, the music industry is a similar kind of thing. I mean, or, or, or really anything, I mean, if you look at like, Vodka, right? Like, vodka is all pretty much the same. I mean, some of it is. I guess there's your bottom shelf vodka and there's your top shelf vodka. But you know, once once you have a like a basic level of if you're gonna do a shot, it's not gonna make you gag. I mean, to me, it's like all pretty much the same. And yet, you have you know brands like Ciroc um, versus Grey Goose, and you know millions and millions of dollars worth of marketing being poured into you know trying to you know which which of these two vodkas is better. Um, you know, and I think in the music industry and in the drug trade, and it's, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, um, you know, look at the the really popular um, you know artists out there. Um, most of them have a thing. I mean, they have like a, a like a very distinct style. You know, they have, they have something about their personality, their persona that you can latch on to. Um, you know, whether it was somebody like Fifty Cent coming up and you know um, kind of busting up out busting up the uh, the sort of Hip hop pop party that had been occurring, you know, with with um, Diddy and kind of the movement to, towards some of the stuff like Jay Z put out on a second album, and you know, here comes Fifty Cent with his bulletproof vest and his tails are getting shot in the face all the time, and you know, uh, it was different, and, and it was something that, that people could latch onto, um, you know, or or somebody like, you know, Pharrell, um, you know, who's got this just like like this like super cool chic kind of. Uh, style that like everybody wants to aspire to, um, you know, he's, he's got an aesthetic. He's got a he's got a brand. Uh, or Little Wayne. I mean, you know, um, he's he's completely insane. He's unpredictable. Um, you never know what he's gonna do. Uh, you know, there's there's always, um, you know, but it, but in the end, uh, I, I think if you take a lot of rappers um, that are popular right now, there's, you know, it's not that their lyrics are necessarily better than others. It's just that. They've done a better job of branding them. So I think Pitbull is a really good example of that. I mean, his, I mean, like personally, I feel like, you know, if you if you put his uh, his verses down next to those of any aspiring decent aspiring rapper, you know, you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. But he really puts himself out there. Um, you know, he's got he's got this image and, and like, you know, you you know you know he's got that distinctive voice. He's like kind of like growl. Um, you know, it's like you know it's Pitbull when he gets on a song, even if you don't like it. Um, so, you know, I think I think it's uh, I think it's you have to have a certain level of talent, but maybe it's not maybe the bar's not that high. And as long as you make yourself really distinctive, you have a, you have a good shot, whether it's in music or drugs or vodka. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> I didn't realize this, um, but curious question here um, from Samantha that. Um, how rare is it for an artist to be able to negotiate a deal with a label for only one album, like Jay Z did with Priority Records? I mean, that is pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think um, it's it, uh, certainly at the time it was extremely rare. Um, you know, and, and you'd have artists getting locked into five and six and seven album deals. Um, or take again, you know, to go back to Fifty Cent, he got it was a five album deal that he got locked into, and I think he's still finishing it up. Um, you know, so uh, Jay Z, I think that was one of the benefits of going with an indie. He didn't have to get locked in. Of course, he got turned down by all the majors. That's the part that he doesn't like to talk about. But um, <clears throat> he got turned down, and um, uh, I talked to DJ Clark Kent, who was one of the guys who helped discover him, and. Was actually working uh, as an A&R at Atlantic at the time, and he remembers kind of trying to shepherd um, that album, Reasonable Doubt, through the whole A&R process at Atlantic. And when they finally got up to the top levels, um, it just didn't resonate with the executives. And and uh, and and Clark Kent said it, it was like he was just rapping too fast. It, <laughs> it went over their heads. They 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 couldn't get it. Um, 
but you know, so certainly in Jay Z's case, taking that one album deal um, and insisting on it uh, with priority with the indie label, um, you know, really opened him up um, to to be able to go out, uh, and, you know, and get a ton more money, um, you know, rather than being locked in. Sam asks. Do rap artists ever try to get into feuds with other rap artists on purpose in order to gain publicity or boost their sales? Oh yeah, I mean I don't think I don't think that uh, Jay Z would ever really admit that, that was his primary motivation for kind of going at it with Nas. But um, you know, if you look at the, the kind of trends of both of their careers at the time, I mean, if anything, it was better for Nas because he was kind of like his career was kind of in the toilet at, the, at that point. Um, before before he came out with uh, Illmatic, but you know when he and Jay Z started feuding, well, I guess was Illmatic maybe Illmatic was Illmatic before the feud. Maybe I'm getting my timing wrong. All right, scratch that. After after Illmatic and before uh, the feud started, Nas's career was kind of in the toilet. Um, but but Jay Z really I think helped bring him back to life. Um, you know, with the feud, but but as I was saying before, you know, Jay Z, this is at a point where he was getting really big uh, as a pop artist, as kind of a mainstream rapper, and you know, to people thought maybe he was getting soft, but to, to kind of start going at it with somebody like Nas, who's that well respected, and um, yeah, I think that really gave him, uh, you know, that it kind of reestablished his credibility. It was funny though, um, Jay Z and Nas, of course, have since reconciled. Nas eventually signed uh, on Jay Z's label on Def Jam, and you know they had this epic um, kind of calling an end to their war, um, which I detail in the book. And and Nas now is kind of following in Jay Z's steps um, on the business side of things. He's actually I interviewed him the other day. He's investing in startups, um, and he's got a stake in this company, uh, this really awesome website called RapGenius.com. I don't know. Have you guys heard of it? Yeah, with Nas. Yeah, Nas is, is like their first verified rapper. Um, so it's like on Twitter you can get verified, while on Rap Genius you can get verified, and you can post your own lyrics and you can comment on your own lyrics. So um, Nas is, you know, has gotten involved with them, um, and he's also investing in this company called The Fancy. It's kind of like it's a little bit like Pinterest. I don't know. Anyway, so you know, Nas was like never on the whole entrepreneurial kick really. At least any 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 in any way like Jay Z was, but um, it, it's funny now he could say he's kind of following in Jay Z's footsteps too. Uh, <clears throat> there's always been a history in hip hop and rap where people guest on other people's. It sort of seems the way to you know bringing people up through the ranks is like you know get on other people's tracks and then you get somebody like Wayne who will go out and do whole bunch of things that he doesn't have to do just because he wants to and, and can get paid. So this was an interesting question posed by um, Melody that um, says that Jay-Z wanted to have Beyonce on uh, Bonnie and Clyde because she was exceptional. He claims since uh, then the single helped them um, exchange audiences, thus giving them both more fans. Do you see Jay Z as a main credit to the success of Beyonce's solo career? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I think that Beyonce is so talented that she would have right. gotten there anyway. Um, but you know, he definitely gave her, um, you know, kind of a, a credibility. Uh, I think on on the. He took her out of like you know being just another. Diva. Yeah. Who sang very well and looked yeah. pretty and made great videos. Yeah. And gave her some more. Cred, I guess. Totally, totally, and you know, and, and by the same token, um, you know, Beyonce Dragged helped him make into pop. exactly, and helped uh, make him more make him more palatable to advertisers, and you know, and that kind of thing. I mean, Carol's daughter, you know, probably wouldn't have been happening if he were still kicking around with Damon Dash. So even in in their personal life, they were almost marketing. Totally. Oh, totally. There's and there's a chapter called uh, Jay Z and Beyonce. Um, marriage or, mer or maybe is it marriage? No, yeah, marriage or merger. I think it's one of the, the last chapters, and uh, it kind of discusses that. Well, I keep going on here. Is there any things that you guys want to bring up? Please, in the back, sir. Oh, yeah, I was really curious, especially like when I read this. Um, how do you think that like up and coming artists, and even artists that like, got a small level, how should they look at like maybe side business ventures? Um, 
is there a point where an artist should start looking at things like that, or should they be more focused on their music, which is their main dream? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I think probably, um, I mean, the focus should always be on the, on the music. If you want to make it as, a, as an artist, right, you should always, like, the first thing is make great music that will, that will make people want to, to be involved with you and hear you and kind of consume your whole lifestyle. Um, but if it's, if it's something that, that you know, it's not, doesn't take too much time, if it's like a, a sideline and, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's like merch or, you know, or maybe it's something you can outsource to somebody else that, on your team where, you know, it's just kind of like you're involved with it, but it's not taking up all your time. Um, you know, I, I think that makes sense. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think generally, you, you know, you want to build it up to the point where, where people want to consume it and consume you. And, I mean, I, I, um, I meet a lot of up-and-coming uh, artists who are like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I have, um, you know, and I, and I own my own studio, and, like, I have, you know, I don't know, uh, like my own line of rolling papers and like all the you know and like and um, but that, actually that, that I think that's kind of a clever use of of because it's you know it doesn't take much time and it's a way to get people to remember you so that that's actually a, an example of something that that would work right like as a sideline um, you know but but you're saying it's a sideline right right because, so because in your writing capacity as a reporter you forget the music industry you're talking to people and so what he's talking about is perhaps what's called line extension right and so. I'm sure the captains of industry you talk to is like you focus on your core business. Right, 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 exactly. And you know, it's like if if an up and coming rapper and I've you know is is a uh, he's like working on a bunch of different things and you know he's like here I've got I've got a clothing and I was like I don't even know what your music is I don't want to buy your clothes you know it's like you, you've got to have a brand before you can start selling it I think. Anyone else? I'll go back to the uh, questions that were posed. Um, not, a, not a really fair question to ask you, but we'll put it out there. Uh, what are the consequences of putting out or playing music live that has not been copyrighted yet? Hmm. Where's Harrington? That has not been, so if, if you're like, an, like playing another artist's music or your own or? It, it just says, the question Andrea posed was music that has not been copyrighted. So you're performing it in public, or putting it, or releasing it. So like, I, I, have, I have a song and I haven't gone through the necessary steps to get it copyrighted. copyrighted but you're going to perform it here tonight. Uh, is, isn't it, I think, isn't there a rule that if you, that like any sequence of notes can be copyright, like as, like as soon as you write them down, I, you know, it's, it's a copyright? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, once it's intended. Yeah. It's a Harrington question. No, well, the, I mean, the, the correct answer is that once someone has access to your work, if it isn't copyrighted, and they can prove access, then uh, you have, there's a case then. Mm. If you keep it in your drawer and you never play it outside, even though it's yours from the day you fix it and copy, the mm -hmm. day you write it down, not. Forget about the registration. Right. Registration just so you can sue in federal court uh, because there's no more state statutes for copyright. So consequently, it's always a question for everyone, should we copyright it before we put it out there? My answer is always put it out there and take a bath on the first one, but hope it'll make you famous. Right. And then continue. Right. So really, Steve's right. It's really not a fair question for 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 you, um, you know, because it's a whole different. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think, yeah, in general, like, the notion of of putting out music for free early on. I mean, I think I think that's kind of where we're where we're moving, whether people like it or not. And we, again, we were talking on the way over here about electronic music, and you know, it's that's totally it's based on the model. You know, put out as much free stuff as you can, get people to listen to it, and then get you know, Pasha or Tao or whatever to pay you a hundred thousand dollars to show up and to plug in your thumb drive. Um, you know, and I, and I think, uh, you know, definitely, I think we're moving more and more towards that model. Although electronic music is ideally suited towards that because there's such little overhead um, for doing a live show. But then you could argue that that also the antecedent to that was um, mixed mixtapes. Mixed yep. Which yep. you know, 
was such a, it was such a conflict in the major labels' brains that um, we don't want to put mixtapes out and giving away. We have copyright issues and piracy, and yet the marketing guys in the back were like, "Okay, we're making some more burning nah. things to give them out because it's the most efficient way to get this new music out into the hands of the public." So, um, you know, on one hand, don't do that. On the other hand, we're doing this because it's the most efficient way to offer exposure. Um, <clears throat> a record company question here posed by Ray was, uh, what do you think one of the obstacles Jay-Z had to overcome after initially being signed to a record label? Um, well, I think Jay-Z, you know, he was a new, unique case because he was already a big deal, um, you know, when he ended up uh, going over to, to Def Jam. Um, it, you know, it's, it's so th they were already invested. He was already, like, he had a, a huge uh, debut album under his belt. I think it was gold by the time he, he went to Def Jam. Um, so I don't think that he had some of the typical challenges of, like, OK, you, you know, you're, you're a young act. You get signed. Now how do you get them to actually pay attention to you and promote you? And you know, um, it's, it's funny. It's kind of analogous to the uh, situation of being a writer. And you get a book deal. Well, OK, you know, how do you get them to promote your book? And, you know, help you go on a, a book tour and, and that kind of thing. Um, and how do you get to become a priority within that internal system? Right, right. Because a lot of artists and musicians make the mistake of their end game is like, oh, I got signed. Right. And I tell you and continue to tell people all the time, that's just the beginning. Right. Because that just is opening the door, and now you've got to figure out how to work that system. Yeah, you know, I, I think it depends on your personality, but um, my, the way I, I try to do it, I think. Um, I, you know, I just kind of, I mean, it, for you know, in terms of uh, in terms of the book, but I think it, it applies in the, in the music industry as well. Um, you just kind of show up and you just like, hey, like I'm, I'll do whatever it takes, like whatever, like send me out. Um, you know, I don't need to stay in a hotel. You, I can stay on a friend's couch. You know, just like send me on this book tour. Um, you know, what about uh, advertising? You know, like okay, like I'll I'll go and I'll get I'll get a lot of promotion myself. Like don't even worry. You know, like look whatever you can, but you know, do do a lot of stuff on your own, right? Like, um, you know, I certainly didn't sit around waiting for them to promote my book. I went out and I you know I used all my contacts to try to get on radio and to try to get on. Well, um, that's that's you, how we met. Exactly. Yeah. He was aggressively pursuing, looking for exposure for his book. Yeah. He came to Sirius XM and said. If any of the talk, any of the show hosts would be interested in talking to me. I'd be open to coming over. After all, I am an established journalist at Forbes, and I think that goes um, for many musicians. They kind of think, again, Endgame. Here's my music. Here, go, go get it played on the radio. Go get it in, this, you know, downloaded in stores. And it's like it's not that. It's not that simple. You got to, you know, they've, you know, Penguins got, you know, half a dozen other priorities that month, and so, you know, why should we? Why should we care about Zach's little book? We got this other book. It's much easier. Let's let's focus on that. And he's got to he's got to be the, the squeaky wheel, as as a musician does within the system. And the difference, I guess, with Jay Z was he was a big wheel when he came in, right. and they ha had to say, okay, how are we going to maximize this thing we have? And I think that Jay Z's situation almost mirrors, you know, kind of what's going on today with, you know, where you build up your brand on an indie label, um, you know, or or. Uh, Maybe you get a deal and you get dropped. Like Wiz Khalifa got, got a deal, got dropped, but then re kind of like built himself up again, um, putting out mixtapes on his own, and, and then got signed to Atlantic. Um, you know, or somebody like Mac Miller, who, who's building up this huge following, hasn't signed with a major yet. Maybe maybe he won't. Um, or somebody like Drake, you know, builds up the buzz. Then you get a bidding war going. Um, you know, and then you sign. So I think Jay Z is more analogous to that than to somebody who. Than he was to me, for example, like a relative unknown. Because I think both at uh, at publishers and at um, music labels, you know, there's just there's sometimes there's the attitude of, oh well, you know, if it, if it's good, it'll it'll speak for itself. <laughs> we don't need to do anything. It'll just magically appear on talk shows and like it'll be fine. Um, but of course, there's you know a lot more to it than that. A lot more. Um, <clears throat> Dan asks, um, do you think? that by taking sides with established artists such as The Roots in the early stages gave Jay more confidence to take possible risks on his own to succeed. And do you think he knew if anything did go wrong, the success of those he helped would return in return help him? Um, I don't think he counted on anybody helping him, um, but, I, but I think he maybe considered it like a down payment on help, like, uh, or like, a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a security deposit, you know, like, 
maybe he would lose a security deposit, but, but probably not. Um, but in terms of uh, the roots, I think, I think that was a very good move for Jay-Z. Um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, his whole career has been this kind of push and pull between um, you know, kind of chasing that mainstream pop prize and then you know, maintaining the credibility within his base you know, and, and making good rap music and, you know, that, that, uh, that the people who bought his first album would buy and that people would continue to be interested in and that they would be elevating the genre and like continuing to push the boundaries and um, you know, I, I think that pal, uh, palling up with the roots, you know, um, I think it was really surprising uh, for a lot of people. I think it was kind of a case of him kind of like directly uh, engaging um, a major tastemaker in, in terms of um, hip hop, but, but also just, I mean, music, you know, music on the whole, like the roots are like so widely well respected. Um, you know, and Quest Love told me he was like, you know, when Jay Z came to us, I was like, what, what the hell does does this guy want to do with us? I mean, he he makes this pop rap, you know, like I don't like what. <laughs> but Quest Love, being you know a very laid back and open dude, um, said, all right, sure, like let's check it out. And and sure enough, Jay Z came in, um, and he was genuinely interested in in you know in making something. Uh, you know that that would elevate his music and their music and and hip hop in general and and he would you know show up on time for rehearsals and he would ask lots of questions and um, and and quest love and and the roots like really quickly grew to like him a lot and you know but it's also kind of a strategic move because you have these great tastemakers who you're you're putting out um, a live album with but but also you're you're kind of winning their respect um, and I think that you know it, it also it helped you know it helped him. Uh, again, retain and gain some credibility. And yet, the Roots now are uh, a nightly, you know, Middle America, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. kind of thing. It's, I mean, you turn on the TV every night, there they are, the Roots. And, you know, doubtless Jay-Z had something to do with that by elevating their profile a little sure. more. So, um, Cindy Lauper recorded a song called Money Changes Everything, and it relates to this second part of his question, do you think that now that he's worth over $450 million, do you think he's more conservative in his ventures, both personally and business? Because he's got that fear that any of us who've made any money would think, ooh, I don't want to jeopardize that nest egg I have. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I don't think he's, I don't think he's worried about jeopardizing, um, you know, his, his empire. I think he's got so much money, you know, he's, He's, I mean, he, he spends money, but he's not foolish about it. Um, you know, I think he only owns uh, one home. Granted, it's like a $10 million penthouse in Tribeca, but still, you know, in your, I mean, there are people who have less money than him, who have seven and eight houses. Um, you know, Damon Dash was, I don't know, I think he had a house in, he had like two houses in New York, and he was renting a mansion in London and a, pl a place in the hills in LA, and, and he, you know, he quickly went under, but you know, I think that Jay-Z is li living well within his considerable means, so I think that's not a risk. Um, but you know, I think it definitely allows him to be more selective uh, about the products he does make. I mean, um, and the music that he makes, too. Uh, you know, if you look at Watch the Throne, um, and, I, and I talk about this a little bit in, in, my, uh, in my new chapter, but I'll but I'll get into, give you guys a sneak peek. Um, like my, my whole argument on Watch the Throne is that, so I, I, I interviewed Birdman about it, because um, uh, Carter, was it Carter 4, I guess, came out right around the same time, and actually did a lot better than Watch the Throne. It did double the, the first week of Watch the Throne. Um, and there were all these allegations that Birdman was you know, going in and like, dropping you know, ten thousand dollars on you know at Best Buy on a bunch oh, of copies of Carter. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> um, right. which, which he denied. But um, you know, and and uh, Young Money, Cash Money was kind of gloating about it. And but but I think that's kind of missing the point because the point. I mean, Watch the Throne was never made as a you know to sell as many CDs as possible. I mean, um, you know, the lead single doesn't have a chorus. <laughs> it's you know. They didn't care. Like they weren't trying to make this a huge radio friendly. This wasn't Blueprint Three. There was no Empire State of Mind. Um, there was no Run This Town. Um, you know, this was Jay Z and Kanye going in and and having fun. Um, and I think trying to create something that that elevated 
um, elevated the art form. And uh, it wasn't, and whether you like the album or not, um, I think you, like, it has to be acknowledged that, you know, that, they, that they didn't go into it just to make money. Um, however, there was an ulterior financial motive you know, for that kind of doing music for the sake of music, art for the sake of art thing, um, which is that the very image of Jay-Z and Kanye going in and making an album um, you know, where they're not concerned about radio and they're not putting a chorus on their lead single uh, is that it's like, gee, here, here are two guys who are, who are really authentic and they wouldn't do anything unless they really believed in it and, you know, um, you know it, or, or isn't that noble of them? And so the next time that Jay-Z does a big uh, endorsement deal, it carries more weight. It makes it, he's more selective. He's, he's this kind of uber, uber luxury endorser um, because he p only picks and chooses and he doesn't need to do it for the money and, you know, and, and he's, he does art for the sake of art and therefore, if he's doing an endorsement deal, you know, it, it, it must not be, he must not be a sellout. He must not be a sellout. That's what he wants you to think anyway. All right. Um, some people feel that um, a, lot, a lot of what Jay-Z's accomplished to date is uh, only happening because he's established and recognizable. So Derek posed the question is, what, what do you think young artists should take away when reading your book? Yeah, uh, I think I would go back to the, the point earlier about um, you've got to keep making great music. If you can make great, iconic music that, you know, that, that people really want to hear and you can keep doing it, um, they'll continue to be interested in you. And you know, if you can hold people's attention, then you can start in with the clothing line and the, you know, the whatever else it is. Um, but you know, from the very beginning, I mean, I would, like personally, I think that Reasonable Doubt is Jay-Z's best album still. Um, and if you just you know go and just like the artistry and the and the rhyme schemes and um, you know the just the the speed of the rap and the cadence and the double and triple and I think there might even be a quadruple, quadruple entendre in there somewhere um, you know I, I think that's what really got him going um, and it's and it's those huge hits that that also were just genuinely great hip hop music that that kept him in the conversation so. You know, I, I guess it's maybe it's cliche to say just keep making great music, but and there's certainly a lot of luck involved and and smarts and knowing when to, you know, tack to to various different sides. But you know, I think that's that's always got to be the focus. So, what's the one lesson somebody could take away regarding Jay Z after reading your book? Well, we haven't uh, talked about it too much today, but um, I think that the the main thing I got out of it is. Always ask questions. Uh, whatever you're doing, just ask a lot of questions. No matter you know who you're with, um, what you know, if it's if it's professionally or personally or whatever, um, but you know, especially professionally, um, you know, how does that work? Like you know, how does that contract work? Well, you know, is it an upfront payment or is it back? Like you know, why are you doing this or why does that that work that way? Or what's um, in it for me? Well, what's in it for me exactly? Um, and you know, that that seemed like kind of a like a, like a simple. It seems like a simple thing, um, but you know, it's embarrassing if you ask questions because you, you'll probably ask some stupid questions, and people well, you don't know how that works. Well, but the only way to find out is if you if you if you keep asking, and that's what everybody who I talked to about Jay Z said. There was like if, if there was one theme that made it all the way through all of the interviews, everybody said he asks lots of questions um, and he absorbs. He, he asks the he finds experts, he asks them the questions. And, and he absorbs the knowledge and adds it to his own thing, like and a hermit crab. Say in the, in the documentary, so something about his curiosity. Exactly. And that's one of the things that set him apart. Yeah. Anyone have any uh, curious, curious things they want to ask to our guest this evening? No. So everybody's a, uh, a Jay Z expert at this point. Would that be fair to say? These smiling faces. Nobody nodding out at this hour. It's great. Well then, um, I'm going to thank Zach for taking the time to come out here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah.